the Conservative Party used to be better able to ride with divisions in its own ranks than, than Brexit allowed it to be. It became a, a, a perfectly acceptable point of view within the Conservative Party in the years leading up to 2016 to be at radical variance with the um, leadership of the party over a, a major issue of policy. Um, and that injected a divisiveness, a, a polemical nature into the internal relations of the Conservative Party that hadn't been there before. Hello, I'm John Stevens. I'm the chair of the Federal Trust, and I'm talking once again to Brendan Donnelly, who is the director of the Federal Trust, about recent developments in the UK regarding Brexit. Brendan, we've had quite a hot week for the Conservative Party uh, with the by-election results and with the controversy over uh, Islamophobia and the rest. Uh, there's clearly a crisis in the Conservative Party. What what is the origin of this? That fundamentally, to what extent is all this really due to and going back to Brexit? I think it is due to Brexit, um, not just Brexit itself, but the impact it had on relationships within the Conservative Party. In the years leading up to 2016, the Conservative Party, for a decade at least, was fundamentally split on a, a major issue of public policy, which obviously was the European Union. And the idea was that uh, that would be resolved, that all would come together um, after a referendum. Now, I'm not sure that was ever a, a plausible hypothesis, but it certainly didn't work out that way. There was further conservative division between um, between party the wings of the Conservative Party during the referendum, after the referendum, and now this division has transmuted um, into a, a general um, uh, aimlessness uh, or disagreement about, aim, about aims within the Conservative Party. Uh, Brexit is certainly not working, and there are differing views as to how you should respond to that. Um, and yet underlying um, the concern about Brexit is also the fear that the electoral, that the Conservative Party is facing electoral wipeout at the end of this year. And there are all sorts of people who have ideas, differing ideas, uh, about how that wipeout can be mitigated um, or perhaps, perhaps even um, avoided entirely. So there are a number of very um, bitter debates going on within the Conservative Party, and, and they, they inter overlap with each other. But the link with Brexit is presumably one to do with the identity of Britain. Uh, is that not the case? Um, and certainly... what, how can one separate that? broad philosophical point from the obvious immediate fears about the likely uh, very severe defeat in a forthcoming general election. It is um, at the centre of Brexit. But my point was that the Conservative Party used to be better able to ride with divisions in its own ranks than, than Brexit allowed it to be. It became a, a, a perfectly acceptable point of view within the Conservative Party in the years leading up to 2016 to be at radical variance with the um, leadership of the party over a, a major issue of policy. Um, and that injected a divisiveness, a, a polemical nature into the internal relations of the Conservative Party that hadn't been there before. You're right, of course, that um, Brexit interplays with um, uh, with sense, with questions about national identity, because the Conservative government, which has been there for so long, has got precious little um, to um, show in the way of uh, political and economic successes since 2010. So naturally, it um, uh, Dr. Johnson would 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 put it um, has access to the last refuge of the scoundrel. Uh, a kind of patriotism, a kind of argument about patriotism and identity. Let's just consider a little bit how the Conservative Party at the moment is is looking ahead to the general election and what strategies are being considered to um, stem the extent of that defeat or, or perhaps even prevent it. How do you see the various elements in that discussion? Well, there is a view... Uh, that uh, America uh, is the um, uh, example that the United Kingdom should follow. Uh, we've had Liz Truss uh, in America recently. There is a wing of the Conservative Party that always thought Brexit was about making the United Kingdom more like America. 
that um, Europe was the wrong model to follow, uh, and America, with its economic dynamism and with its economic liberalism um, and with its position, if you like, as a, a hegemon within the world, was the, the model to follow. Uh, that might have been a more plausible argument, um, but for the presence of, of Mr. Trump, uh, who even those who are generally sympathetic in this country to American ideas and American economic philosophy um, really find beyond the pale. Uh, I think the Conservative Party is not well advised to associate itself with Mr. Trump. One of the features of contemporary America, of course, is the, uh, the problems of running uh, an enormous uh, multicultural society and the debates that are entailed with that, of which Trump, of course, is a, an important expression. Uh, to what extent is that being imported into Britain by the current issues within the Conservative Party? I think the importation is quite striking. It's both um, both in in terms of ethnic and, and national and even racial debates, um, and also in, in the culture wars. Um, the culture wars are, are certainly something which has been imported from the from United States. Um, and I think it's underpinned in the Conservative Party by the, the, the rather patronising idea that everybody who comes from the Red Wall seats uh, is socially reactionary um, and uh, has a, a robustly commonsensical dismissal um, of, of woke ideology, of um, transgender questions, of anything that um, isn't the way uh, the social structure and uh, assumptions of, of the 1950s were configured. Uh, I, I think there may be some truth in that, um, but it, it's not uh, going to be a, a silver bullet to preserve the Conservative Party at the time of the next election. Um, what's perhaps a bit more sinister is the, the, the quasi-racist element which has crept into Conservative discourse over the past um, um, four or five years. Uh, we've had particularly this issue of um, Lee Anderson. Um, there's every chance, it seems to me, that he will end up in the Reform Party. And there will be some Conservatives who will uh, sympathise with his ideas about London in particular, uh, having be having fallen into the hands of, of Islamists um, because uh, the present mayor of London, uh, Sadiq Khan, is simply their, their puppet, their tool. We had a rather extraordinary uh, day in the House of Commons recently uh, over the debate on Gaza and the controversy that arose. Do you see this intrusion of identity issues, uh, cultural issues into our politics as being part of all this and, and a, a dangerous development? I, th I think it's, it's a bit simpler than that in, in a way. Uh, with, within the United Kingdom, uh, I think there are more people um, who are critical of the Israeli government and its approach to um, uh, its own security than they used to be. Um, and that goes right across society. And of course, it's true that there is a, a Muslim population, a substantial Muslim population now within the United Kingdom in a way there wasn't 30 or 40 years ago, um, which uh, understandably um, is very sympathetic to um, the various versions of, of the Palestinian cause. It, it's also true that the, the, the Muslim vote is very important for the Labour Party. Uh, so there are a number of cross currents going on in the political uh, fabric of the, the United Kingdom, uh, which uh, partly are to do with identity, but partly are to do with with traditional ways in which the, the electoral cake needs to be cut up between the two main parties. Well, one reason why the Conservatives won such a large victory in 2019 was the personality of Jeremy Corbyn and his association in particular with anti-Semitism, but with a general form of extremism that was easily branded um, and credibly branded as unpatriotic. Do you think the Conservative Party is trying to revive this a bit by playing on this Islamic issue and uh, trying to use that as a, as a tool uh, going into the next general election? I, I think it may be, but I don't think the reason why um, uh, Corbyn did so badly in the 2019 general election was primarily, primarily um, because of his association with anti-Semitism. I think it was a much more general um, sense of um, extremis extremism and incompetence. Uh, I, I think the Conservatives would be would, would be well advised um, to steer clear uh, of, of any two 
definite or exact identification of their brand um, with, um, uh, with the security policies of, of the state of Israel. Um, interestingly, um, Starmer, of course, um, finds himself in, in a dilemma uh, because he thinks that, that uh, in order to reassure um, wavering voters in the center, um, he mustn't be seen to be identified with what has traditionally been regarded um, uh, as an extreme view, namely outspoken support for the Palestinian um, cause. Um, but on, on the other hand, uh, as I said, um, the Labour Party has a number of Muslim MPs and uh, a number of constituencies where there's a very substantial Muslim vote. These uh, cultural and identity issues uh, overlay what has been the traditional left-right debate, um, which has focused very much um, in the past on um, tax cuts versus public spending. And there are clearly some conservatives who believe that to go back to that old formula and to uh, bring in tax cuts now is a way certainly of stemming the scale of uh, any future defeat. Do you think that's credible given the economic and financial situation in which the UK finds itself? Well, credible to whom is the, the, the question you have to put in response to that. Uh, I don't think it's going to make any difference. Uh, I don't think it's going to make any difference either economically or politically. Um, but I think within the Conservative Party, it will have a certain popularity because tax cuts is, is one of the few triggers um, to which everybody in the Conservative Party responds positively. Um, and moreover, the consequences, the negative consequences of tax cuts um, will probably only only be felt after the general election. So I, I think it, it, it's a, an interesting indication of the reversal within the Conservative Party that budgetary prudence will take second place to the, the crowd-pleasing elements, as they see it, um, of tax cuts. But this is uh, put on show, perhaps, uh, by the platform that reform is adopting, because it is both playing on identity issues, cultural issues, uh, raising questions of um, Islamic influence and the rest in in, in our politics. Uh, but it is also playing uh, with the association of, of uh, Liz Truss and Nigel Farage um, with uh, notions of traditional tax cutting and uh, traditional liberal economic conservatism. Uh, is that platform, which is clearly internally very incoherent, but is it likely to have some success? And to what extent is reform really a problem for the Conservative Party going into the next general election? It's a major problem going into the next election for the Conservative Party. Uh, uh, I think there's every chance that it will cost the Conservative Party I don't know, 10 or 20 seats. Uh, and it will certainly um, uh, allow those people who want the Conservative Party to move closer to reform um, to argue that the party can't be re-elected to government uh, uh, until it has a, a better relationship with reform. Uh, I would be very surprised if within the next year or so, two years perhaps, um, reform and the Conservative Party don't merge together in some form. It would be interesting to see who takes over whom um, and when it happens. I don't rule out the idea of reform standing down um, some of its candidates um, before the general election in order to help the Conservative Party. That would be a, a sort of dowry that it will bring into the marriage after the general election. Or it may be that they decide they're going to stand everywhere and, and show the Conservatives what they can do. But when people talk about the Conservative Party needing to rediscover its centrist soul after the next general election, I, I think they're deceiving themselves. I think structurally, um, the, the path of the Conservative Party is towards reform um, rather than back to the centre. But to what extent is this debate uh, about um, reform striking before the general election or waiting until after the general election for a takeover to be uh, performed on the Conservative Party. Because uh, clearly, if the defeat is enormous, um, even if reform is able to capture the Conservative Party in opposition, if the Labour Party has a very large majority, it's likely to be in for more than one term. 
Uh, it may be in for more than one term, uh, but I don't think that's a given by any means. I think the the economic problems that, uh, that this Conservative government is lead, leading the Labour Party uh, will be enormous. Um, and I think that uh, come 19, 2028, 2029, Starmer may well find that it's not enough simply not to be the Conservative Party. That's the basis on which he's going to win a, a very substantial majority this time round. In four or five years' time, it, it may be that people are asking, um, where's the beef? Where's the, the real content um, of, um, of, of Starmerite policies? I don't rule out the possibility um, that halfway through the next parliament, Starmer may conclude that the best political narrative he can come up with uh, is a European one, and that... Um, uh, when we come to the next general election, um, there will be clear water. Um, I don't know what colour water, but water between uh, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party on Europe. Uh, and at the moment, um, uh, the water's um, uh, pretty pretty muddy, the, which, which separates the Conservatives from the Labour Party. But the irony may be that expectations that the Labour Party might get into difficulties in government fairly rapidly is actually preventing a fragmentation of the Conservative Party now, because presumably the calculation of those Conservative MPs who are looking to lose their seats now, particularly those from the Red Wall, um, they might, as you suggested earlier, have a temptation to join reform now and to uh, create a genuine crisis for Conservatism. Um, but on the whole, they seem more likely to wait until after the general election. And this obviously includes, above all, the position of Nigel Farage, so, I mean, on balance, you don't think that there is going to be a crisis before the general election, that the moment of truth for the relationship between reform and conservatism is coming after an electoral defeat. Yes, I think that's more likely, but that there are, as they say, a lot of moving parts in this. And and one can't underestimate the uh, the personal element in this. Uh, if, if we had uh, an absolutely reliable insight in, into the personal calculations of Nigel Farage, I think we'd be much better placed to make a, a prediction. Um, and it may be that he himself hasn't yet made up his mind. Things could move quite quickly um, when once a general election is declared. Finally, you suggested that uh, in a, a, a Labour government getting into difficulties, it would turn towards a more European policy. And this is a, clearly a hope of... Uh, a very large number of pro-Europeans in, in the UK at the moment, that although the Labour Party is not talking about uh, a European policy at all, in fact, denying one rather strenuously, uh, nevertheless, uh, after an electoral victory, particularly a large one, uh, there will be the room to be able to move closer to Europe and that the entire agenda of getting more growth in the UK economy and the rest depends on that. But is there not a fundamental problem that if you go into a general election without any form of suggestion that you would be moving in a more pro-European direction, uh, that you don't have a mandate and that therefore the that manoeuvre in government is going to be that much more difficult. It, it will be much more difficult, uh, which is why I think uh, uh, that anyone who wants the United Kingdom to rejoin the European Union um, ought to be saying so loud and clear now to be putting whatever pressure they can on 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 the Labour Party. Um, but uh, my argument is is not so much that there's a plan halfway through the next Parliament to veer in a more pro-European uh, direction. My thought is more that circumstances will leave no option for the government at, at the time. Um, and if that's so, then it will be easier for them to argue, not easy, but easier for them to argue, um, that they have no alternative, that circumstances have turned against the country so badly um, that there's no rational economic alternative other than getting much, much closer to Europe. And you think those circumstances will be sufficiently severe to uh, contain any very hardline anti-European opposition party that emerges from some uh, union between reform and conservatism after the general election? Uh, I think it's possible, but uh, it's one of the great uncertainties of future British politics, whether this um, 
United Reform Conservative Party uh, will be able to to establish itself in the mainstream of, of, of British politics. There are a lot of people who think that could never happen, that this is a, a, a an entirely freakish and a marginal phenomenon that's coming down the track towards us. Um, but I don't think one can say with certainty um, that that will be so. I, I think we, we might well have um, uh, a, a, a politically effective um, very right-wing conservative reform party, which is the alternative to the Labour Party in the general election of 2029. It's ironic, isn't it, that uh, the Brexit vote was supposedly resolving a major dispute in British politics, um, whereas in fact it has opened up far more disputes and created a far higher level of uncertainty going forward than we've had um, really for at least two generations. Brendan, many thanks for this discussion. Man plans and God laughs, I think is the answer to that. Brendan, many thanks for this. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this discussion. It's one of many that we have on, on this topic. And I hope you will continue to follow us in the future.